All right, starting out quickly this week or I'll smack you with my beak. And support Baroud as we're almost halfway to our target goal. So if you want to make a little boy's Christmas dreams come true, you know what to do. The NWA TNA show starts out this week with one of those rambling Raven promos where he stands in the darkness at the TNA arena. He's hyping up his match with the Sandman tonight in a Raven's Clockwork Orange House of Fun match. He says it's his destiny to become the NWA Heavyweight Champion and he won't be stopped by AJ or the Sandman. I think he's forgotten a certain man who's known for slapping nuts. He's suddenly interrupted by Kevin Sullivan. I had no idea he even appeared in TNA. He compliments Raven on his sick, demented mind and says that he's going to be a special observer in the match tonight. This is apparently going to be the most violent match of all time, so it's getting some big hype. Raven welcomes him to TNA and says it's too late for him to pass the torch as he's an old bastard. Raven suddenly falls to the ground and it seems to be the Sandman who's hit him with an early shot tonight. Conan comes out to the ring now. He's fighting a war against the X Division and Jerry Lynn. He's bringing luchadors to TNA and today it will be super crazy. For some reason the Latin music is so loud that I can't hear myself think. He will take on Jerry Lynn. Super Crazy really gets the best of the opening exchange with numerous arm drags and a pinning attempt. These two guys had a rival in ECW and it shows that they've wrestled before. They know each other inside out. They keep reversing each other and Super Crazy eventually scores a clothesline knockdown. Lynn isn't phased and he reverses a powerbomb and then he takes Crazy out the ring with a head scissors. He tries to come back into the ring but Lynn drop kicks him and then dives off the apron with a hurricanrana. Super Crazy does a 10 punch in the corner and the crowd chant the numbers in Spanish. The chanting doesn't help him and Lynn springs off the ropes with a tornado DDT. They start running about which ends with Crazy giving Lynn a spinning heel kick. Then with Lynn on the outside Crazy gives him a springboard acai moonsault. Super Crazy is really having a good match, he gives Lynn a lion salt back in the ring but just comes up short. Completely against the run of play, Jerry Lynn hits the TKO for a two cut of his own. Lynn wants to finish this one off but Conan gets on the ring apron. Crazy gives him a basement drop kick and a top rope lion salt. It's somehow just another two. Good match we've got going here. Super Crazy gives Lynn a tornado DDT and then picks him up straight away with a sit up powerbomb. Lynn kicks out again. This is getting ridiculous now. He must think he's a certain other blonde haired wrestler. Jerry Lynn then wins with a roll up seconds later. He barely hit a move in this match. Probably a better match than the Hooven Toot one last week. Conan dumps in his nappy of anger as he's desperate to beat Jerry Lynn. He slaps Super Crazy but he doesn't slap him back. We have a pre-recorded segment now, it's a sit down interview of Mike Tanay and Vince Russo. Russo looks very sad because last week his children said they didn't like the way their dad had been raising them. He's fake crying and saying that wrestling doesn't mean much to him anymore and that he's done with the wrestling business. The Hot Shots are out now who are the team of a blonde CM Punk and a depressed version of Shane Douglas. They're accompanied by beyond boring and gifted Glenn Gilberti. What makes him gifted? They take on Slash and Brian Lee who jumps them straight away. Sonny Don't Look At My Ass Siaki also appears with Desire and he's lecturing the other SEX members and he takes them back to the locker room. The Slash Man is completely destroying the hotshots on his own. This guy has such unique offence, he's been quite underrated in this series, I think it's probably because he doesn't do anything funny. Brian Lee destroys Shane Douglas Jr with elbows but I'm pretty sure the last one completely misses. The truth is shown sitting in the crowd looking depressed because he's being forced to watch this show. Shane Douglas makes the blind tag and CM Punk Blonde Just For Men hits drop kick from the top whilst Douglas Jr holds Slash. The long haired one then misses a dive in the corner and Slash hits him with the eye of the storm. Bulldozer Brian Lee is in now and he hits a choke slam and tries a tombstone but he gets double team Russian leg sweep. Douglas Jr then misses a springboard frog splash. The Slash man tries a sent on but he misses. Dude, I was watching the NWA TNA show the other day. And this dude, the Slash Man, he stole my swanton bomb finishing maneuver, man, but he missed it. I'm going back to Carolina, and I'm going to tell my stoner friend Shannon all about you, Slash. Blonde CM Punk also misses a moonsault, but Brian Lee hits a top rope knee drop. Blonde CM Punk then hits a running sit-out powerbomb for a two. Then he tries to cheat using part of the turnbuckle. It doesn't end the match and the New Church win with a doomsday dropkick. A fun short match but I wish the New Church had something more meaningful to do. The Hot Shots are confronted by the Nazi boys for losing and they all brawl. So I guess the Hot Shots joining SEX is over before it even started, what a shame. The Nazis give them the buff Bagwell treatment. Goldilocks is in the back with Hardcore Hack now, he says he doesn't really understand what his match with Raven is tonight. He goes on to talk about how great Kevin Sullivan is and he reminisces about how much he loves Sullivan. Maybe he should be in this match instead then. Now we have Mike Tanay bringing out a wild slap nuts appears.
At this point, I left my desk and sat on my couch because I expect this might go on for a while. Tanae asks Jarrett about Russo leaving the wrestling business. Slapnut says he can't believe it. He starts praising what a great man Russo is. This doesn't even make sense. It's Jarrett's fault that Russo had a breakdown due to filming his kids. This talking segment has now been running for five minutes about Russo. We then move on to talking about the challenge of Raven and AJ Styles and the next generation. That brings the next generation out. They are an out of his mind Brian Lawler, a constipated David Flair and a man called Eric Watts who thinks he's a main eventer. They start talking about things that happened in the 1980s. I almost fell asleep. Watts is unhappy that Slapnuts has been more successful than him. Apparently Jeff Jarrett should have helped him out when they were in the WWF and stopped him from being a jobber. I don't think anybody knows who Eric Watts even is. Brian Lawler's acting wacky and it's the only thing saving this segment. Watts asks Jeff to hit him with the chair but he doesn't do it and then the segment ends. What a waste of time. Now some hillbilly music plays and out comes Disgrace Lamb with his peanut butter sandwich. He's with gifted Glenn Gilbert and Sanders again. Jorge Estrada is his opponent who's looking very different lately. He still has the Fly Into Graceland song so he's still good with me. Just want to thank you all for helping us reach 75k subscribers. We've almost reached Graceland. So if you haven't done so already, become a subscriber or I'll rip out your teeth with a plier. Jorge knocks Disgraceland down. Then Don't Look At My Ass Siaki appears again saying they need to have another meeting and Sanders and Disco leave the ring again. Disgraceland is upset that his little friends have left him and he gets booted in the chin. Jorge climbs up to the top rope but misses his frog splash. Disgraceland almost rolls him up from that. The big man then hits a slingshot suplex for another two. Then he hits a bridging German suplex for yet another two. Jorge then finally fights back. I'm surprised he's having so much trouble with Disgraceland. The disgraced one tries a knee but Jorge turns it into a two. Then Disgraceland gets his 50th two count with a pin. He tries a dancing axe from the middle rope but he gets a punch to the gut instead. Completely against the run of play, Estrada hits some sort of move for the free. It looks like Jimmy Rave's Rock Around the World finisher. I hope you enjoyed Disgraceland in TNA because you'll never see him again. In the back, Siaki is trying to take control of SEX. Everyone is screaming and flying to Graceland is playing so loudly I can't hear them. Disco calms them all down and says that he's in charge. Another boob lady and the albino Harry Potter are here, but I don't know why. The segment's over. I have a headache. Kid Cash will defend his X Division title against the Amazing Red now. This is when I decided to move back to my desk. Wait, why is there a superhero dancing in the stripper's cage? Who the hell is that? What, did they win a competition or something? It's good to see Amazing Red again. It's been a month or so at least. Red starts out with a boot to the gut and a bad looking splash in the corner. Cash sweeps his leg out but can't stamp on him as Red's too quick. They start arm dragging each other and they look pretty even. They trade off more arm drags to prove they're still even I guess. Cash drop kicks him in the leg and he decides to ground the Amazing One. This trade-off now is incredible. Cash really has been a great X Division champion, but he has to bail to the outside. Red dives down on him from the ring. They both continue to try and throw chairs at each other, which ends with Cash winning the chair throwing contest. Cash comes back to the ring with a huge flying clothesline for a two count. Then during a replay, Amazing Red fights back at the code red. Cash isn't having it and he hits that nice fisherman suplex into a knee for a two. Cash tries to fly again, but this time he gets stopped. Red actually superplexes him. Surprised it wasn't a Hurricanrana. Amazing Red tries a moonsault now, but Cash stops him and tries to German suplex him. Red flies through the air like a leaf in the wind. Somehow that's just a two. Amazing Red isn't very hurt and he hits the 718 with Cash getting his foot on the ropes. Amazing Red then kicks Cash off the ring apron, but Red misses his dive. Instead he hits Trinity. Apparently Trinity saved Cash, but the camera doesn't show it. Red is still in this one and he hits a diving DDT and a standing shooting star. That's also just a two. Cash then hits the moneymaker for the win. They were extremely even, but the story here is what happened with Trinity. I believe this is the start of Kid Cash's heel turn, although he gives her a hug after the match, so we're not quite there yet. Goldilocks is now in the back trying to interview Jeff Jarrett, but AJ Styles bursts into the locker room screaming that he wants a rematch. AJ says if he doesn't give him one, he'll take it. Jarrett says he isn't taking shit. Jeff says he'll give him another shot, but on his own terms. Mike Tanay interviews America's Most Wanted now who look like twins for some reason. They look really, really depressed and they're very subdued. Maybe their dogs died. They say they're the number one contenders for the tag titles, but instead of that they're facing Gilberti and Sanders tonight. Harris says the only problem with the match tonight is that the fans at home are going to get up and leave the room. Well at least TNA is self-aware. That match is now. I would leave the room too, but I kind of have to do this, don't I? AMW still look depressed on the way to the ring. They should roll straight through these two goons, but I know they won't beat Russo's boys with these. Boring tries a powerbomb, but he gets a Storm head scissors instead. They show the truth in the crowd again. Tanay says that the truth is crying. <laughs> is it any surprise that this guy is now worthless? 
He's gone from the champion to sitting crying in the crowd. Storm levels Gilberti with the super kick and Harris comes in. He hits a bulldog and smacks Sanders one for being boring. Gifted Glenn Gilberti tries to mount a comeback but gets a Lufez press. Harris beats up the jobbers on his own and he throws Sanders out of the ring onto Disco. Storm also dives to the outside on top of them. AMW are really dominating and they hit the dropkick spinebuster combination. Somehow Sanders turns the tide when the match should really be over at this point. Team SEX hit a jawbreak and neckbreaker combination on the cowboy. Disco then hits the Russian leg sweep but he misses his top rope attack. Storm eventually manages to fight back and he hits a kick to Disco Inferno and gets his partner Chris Harris in. Harris has a house on fire and Disco is too scared to stop him. The crowd are very distracted by something. Wait, what? Storm and Harris hit a spinebuster clothesline combination, but for some reason, Moondog Spot is here. That has to be one of the most random TNA appearances. This is certainly the height of random old bastards appearing on TNA. Harris has Sanders tapping out of the sharpshoot, but Elix Skipper, who also loves Russo, hits him with a steel chair. Thank God Harris kicks out. Disco and Sanders both crash into each other and Harris hits the spear. Storm wants to hit a dive, but he gets shoved off by Skipper. Elix hits another chair shot, this time to the face. Disco rolls over to make the cover. No, no, no. What the hell is the point in this? Are Disco and Sanders going to be the new tag team of the decade? If AMW weren't depressed before, they sure are now after losing to this goon squad. Goldilocks is in the back with the SEX team. Siaki is trying to run the team again, but he gets smacked by Beyond Boring. They brawl into the crowd. Maybe Beyond Boring can beat three young TNA talents in one night. The ring is now shown covered in chains in preparation for the Raven match, but the brawl is still going on. Sanders is kicking his ass, but Desire defends her man. Hollywood, the new SEX boob lady, stops her and she gets a Desire spear and a catfight starts. The Nazi boys play the peacekeepers here. You know you're in trouble when the Nazis are the peacekeepers. Siaki and Sanders reluctantly shake hands. Desire and Hollywood go to do it, but Desire gives her a rock bottom for some reason. I preferred the other blonde boob lady from last week. Maybe they couldn't get her and they thought we would think that she was the same woman. It's not. In fact, I'm pretty sure that's what they're actually trying to do here. It's a different lady, trust me. Just the main event now. Here's the special enforcer, Kevin Sullivan. He's here to make sure this match is as violent as possible. Raven is very excited for this House of Clockwork fun match. Let's see if the Sandman can get his first win in TNA. It doesn't start well for him as Raven hits him with a trash can lid straight away. Sandman then low blows him back and drop kicks him in the corner. Hack sends him out the ring. The Sandman tries to rearrange the guardrail but he struggles. He eventually sets Raven up and gives him the guillotine leg drop off the ring apron. Raven's already busted open. They come back to the ring where Raven fails to drop toe hold on the trash can but he does hit the Raven effect. The match isn't done as Raven and Sullivan get a piece of a cage and Raven throws Hack into it. Raven starts then using a chain. This chain actually looks and sounds legit. Raven's burning through these weapons, there won't be any left at this rate. Sullivan hands him a chair and he creams the Sandman. Now Raven does manage his drop toe hold onto a chair. Raven then uses a piece of metal which gets stuck on Hack's throat. Raven sets Hack up on the table and he gives Sandman an elbow drop through the table. Sandman isn't done and he hits Raven with a box of beer. Hack starts smashing him time and time again with two trash can lids. They head backstage now and they go up some steps which never ends well for the Sandman up there. Sandman thinks he's got Raven on the ropes, but he doesn't. They start brawling in the rafters with Raven using a fire extinguisher. Suddenly, Jesus, Raven throws Hack off the balcony through about 10 tables. That's the end of the match, apparently. Raven gets the mic now and he's calling out Slapnuts. He says, give me a title shot right now. He must be dumb because he's lost at least 20% of his blood at this point. Jarrett does come out, but he hits Raven with his belt straight away. Slapnuts also smacks him with a kendo stick and a trash can lid. Jeff Jarrett is a hardcore Slapnuts tonight. AJ Styles appears and tries to hit Jeff with a chair, but Slappy dodges and he hits Raven instead. Now Brian Lawler and David Flair are in the ring. Jarrett steals Flair's burlap sack and he knocks them both down. Fake main eventer Eric Watts is also here and he hits Slappy with a baseball bat. The new generation then triple team Slapnuts. They put the sack over his face and the deranged Brian Lawler laughs and hits a top rope leg drop. Then he dances around screaming. Flair finally reveals what's been in the sack the whole time that he's been holding since his TNA debut, and it's the original NWA title. The show goes off the air of Eric Watts choking out Slapnuts. Decent show, but too many jobbers and goons on this show. Let's check out the second episode. The show starts out with Slapnuts and a baseball bat. He starts hitting the SEX locker room door with it, but he's unable to gain entry. Conan has the opening segment again, and he brings out Damien666 and Halloween. Of course, they're facing Jerry Lynn. For some reason, he's tagging with the king of the cab driver slam, David Young. 
Young takes both the luchadors out of a clothesline and then he hits the cab driver slam, the cab driver slam. Somehow it's just a two. Has anyone ever kicked out of that move? Conan is on commentary making fun of David Young. He says he needs a personality transplant. He's not lying. Young hits an overhead suplex to give Jerry his first match action. He gets a two from a head scissors. Then David Young decides to dive to the outside and Conan uses this to hit a cheap shot whilst Damien almost puts Lynn away. The luchadors try a giant swing on Lynn, but it doesn't look very good. Then out of nowhere, Lynn reverses a double team and he scores a roll up. That was the worst of the Conan luchador matches. Conan takes Lynn out after the match and he hits a rolling clothesline. His own team have to pull him off Jerry Lynn. Goldilocks is now in the back of Eric Watts, but he's jumped by Slapnuts. Security are almost on them straight away. That man Watts comes out to the ring, but Slapnuts is back again. This is not a match that I'm looking forward to. Kid Cash and Trinity are interviewed by Goldilocks now. Cash says tonight he's going to give his fans something special. Amazing Red is also here and he says he only won because of Trinity. She didn't really do that much in their match. I think that's a bit of a stretch, really. Now, D'Lo Brown debuts in TNA. He's apparently here to cut a shoot promo about the WWE. Actually, no, he says WWE doesn't mean anything to him and it's not worth him talking about those bitches. Then he just randomly changes his mind. He said they kept telling him he wasn't good enough. He says that TNA have promised him a totally level playing field. I guess that's minus slap nuts. He's eventually interrupted by Sonny Don't Look At My Ass Siaki. These two are going to have a bit of a long running feud in TNA. Siaki asks him to join Sports Entertainment Extreme. Hang on, I thought Disco and Sanders were in charge of recruitment. D'Lo says no to that invitation. Siaki then brings up the racism storyline with Teddy Long and the WWE and says he thought it was a work, but it's not. D'Lo flips and he beats him up. He hits sky high. Welcome to TNA, D'Lo Brown. I just want to point out that unlike a lot of these random wrestlers we have turning up on the show, D'Lo will actually have a bit of a run with a company, so get used to seeing him. Next up we have a freeway dance for the X Division Championship. Johnny Storm is making his TNA debut. He faces Amazing Red and the champion Kid Cash. Today and West keep saying that Cash has been successful since being with Trinity. Cash hasn't actually done anything wrong and it's just like he's being forced to turn heel. Johnny Storm is apparently 12 stone, which is how much I weighed when I was 14. Very impressive. Storm and Red work together to take out Cash before everyone starts fighting. All three go for a drop kick at once and then they go to shake hands but Red flips Cash off. Storm hits a reverse suplex before he gets clotheslined by Cash. Storm hits Cash back with an enziguri kick. Storm gets Red on the top rope and he throws him off with a hurricanrana but Cash catches him and power bombs him. Storm has to break up the pin attempt. Cash gives Storm the suplex into the knee and Red will have to break up that pinning attempt. Amazing Red starts doing well against Cash with the code red and a big kick. Red also drives Storm from the top rope. Somehow Johnny Storm is the fourth man with the surname Storm to appear in TNA. You'd think they would have remedied that. That very man now hits an inverted hurricanrana on Red from the top. Cash kicks Red and then goes high risk. He hits a springboard senton kick to the nutsack of Johnny Storm. All three guys are spent now. Cash throws both guys from the top with a double German. Red flies through the air like a leaf in the wind. Johnny Boy isn't done yet and he hits Cash with a wheelbarrow into a DDT. Not seen it done like that before. Red stops his offence with a clothesline. Then it all goes a bit wrong. Red tries a nice dive to the outside but he falls on his knee. Trinity tries a moonsault but she misses everyone. Storm dives but he only hits Trinity. Amazing Red is out of the match now as Cash almost puts Storm away of a moonsault in the ring. Storm fights back with the reverse Frankensteiner for a two count. Storm and Cash keep reversing each other until eventually Cash hits a devastating money maker for the three. A really fun match. The commentary team put over how it's all because of Trinity again. What, because she missed a moonsault and then took one from Storm? Red gets in her face so Cash takes him out. Goldilocks is still hanging around the SEX locker room. She asks Sonny why he didn't have backup when D'Lo beat him up earlier. Sanders is being a dick again and they throw punches. Disco starts taking control of the group again. He asks Skipper why he's here and he says because it's prime time. He also complains about Loki and Daniels for going to Japan constantly. Disco manages to actually get them all on the same page. He says solely they're all worthless. But together they have some value. Well, he's got that right. The Nazi boys are out now. They take on the Sandman and Steve Carino. Surely the Sandman could get his first TNA win here. Sandman has his extended long entrance here, pouring beer into all the fans' mouths. It goes on for so long that Carino gets sick of waiting and he starts the match on his own. It doesn't seem to matter and he takes the bold boys out on his own. Wait. Then <laughs> the Nazis hit the H-bomb on Carino and it's over in 20 seconds. Sandman continues his losing ways in TNA. Sandman's entrance was a lot longer than the match. The Nazi boys are hitting him with a chair, but Karina makes the save. They all smash each other in the face with weapons like complete idiots. The Nazis eventually win this battle too. 
Goldilocks interviews beyond boring Mike Sanders, but he's more interested in looking down Hollywood's bra. Disco walks up and says just because you're Kevin Nash's buddy doesn't mean a thing. He then starts insulting Hollywood and says that she's only here to put the sex in SEX and she needs to show her assets tonight. Dusty Rhodes is now out looking quite happy of himself. He calls out the new generation, Flair, Lawler and Watts, the three friends. Eric Watts doesn't come out of his friends though. Dusty says Jarrett is not to blame for Eric Watts not achieving anything in wrestling. He's right to be fair. He moves on to start insulting the Flair family who calls David an asshole. He moves on to Laurel and tells him he can do some incredible stuff but he keeps going around acting like a fool. Lawler starts taking off his jacket but the dream says please don't get naked in front of me. He keeps telling Lawler how good he is and his face lights up with happiness. Lawler tells him to give him five so Dusty says I'll give you five and he smacks him one. Dusty starts fighting the two guys on his own but he's outmatched. Then D'Lo Brown scrambles into the ring and makes the save. Unfortunately Eric Watts gets in the ring to keep the numbers advantage. Slapnuts ensures things are even and the NWA boys stand tall. Triple X are in the back with Goldilocks. Loki takes this promo and says he's not worried about facing America's most wanted tonight for the vacant tag titles. It's a decent promo from Loki to be fair, this match should be good. But we will have to wait for that one as beyond boring Mike Sanders is walking out to the ring. He says he's dedicating tonight's win to Vince Russo. His opponent will be Hacksaw Jim Duggan who's making his TNA debut. This match is happening because Sanders was speaking smack about Duggan for absolutely no reason a few weeks ago. Sanders punches have zero effect and he gets smacked down time and time again. Sanders also gets smacked about on the outside of the ring. Eventually Sanders manages to cut Hacksaw off when he tries to come into the ring. This is one of the slowest matches I've ever seen. Sanders misses a mid-rope moonsault and then he gets beaten following a clothesline. Simply terrible. NWA Impact brings you the smack of the week. Sponsored by all new Blonde for Men. If you're a brown haired potter, put some blonde in it. It makes you look hotter. Mike Sanders, he's looking for the boring plex man. He jumps off the middle rope, but he misses it. Packs on Jim Duggan, man. He looks like a bull in a field. He charges his titties wobbling like he needs to be milked, and he smacks Sanders down. It's like a Mexican bullfighting contest, man. That was the NWA TNA Smack of the Week, sponsored by Blonde Just for Men. Get it? Got it? Shove it. Gifted Glenn Gilberti is out now, and he's not happy that his friend lost to Jim Duggan. Then Duggan beats them both up on his own. These two guys beat America's Most Wanted, and that seems even more pointless now. Sanders and Gilberti eventually turn around and beat him down to end the segment. Goldilocks now has an interview with AJ Styles who sat in the Raven's Nest. He tells her to zip it a couple of times. He says he's taking a dump in Raven's Nest. Raven is provoked by this, but Styles throws a chair at him and he dances around like a goon. The Nazi boys are peacekeepers once again to Raven. Who would have thought that they would continuously be the calm heads in this faction? Things improve now as we have the match for the vacant tag titles. America's Most Wanted versus Christopher Daniels and Loki, who's with Skipper. Storm drop kicks the warrior out the ring and we get a bit of a chaotic brawl. Storm gives Loki a hip toss on the ramp. AMW win the brawl on the outside and then they come to the ring with Harris hitting a big cross body for a two. They hit the drop kick into the spine buster on Daniels and then they throw Loki into Daniels. Skipper starts distracting the referee as Daniels hits an enziguri to turn the match around. Daniels and Loki start working together on Storm as Daniels drops him on his face and Loki hits a basement dropkick. The cowboy keeps almost getting pinned by the Triple X team. Loki eventually misses a springboard kick and gets a James Storm clothesline. He can't make the tag though as Daniels takes out Harris. Storm again keeps fighting but Loki cuts him off again. Then he does manage to make the tag and Daniels dumps in his nappy when he sees Harris. Chris Harris gives him a full Nelson slam, not seen that from him before. He also gives the fallen angel a running power slam, Loki has to make the save. Harris comes even closer with a powerbomb on Loki. America's Most Wanted start to get rolling and they hit the death sentence on Daniels. The referee is pulled out of the ring. Skipper's now in the ring attacking MW but he can't get the job done. Loki tries a cartwheel kick but he gets countered with a spine buster. Elix Skipper starts setting up weapons around the ring. He then tries a chair shot but Storm kicks him. Daniels is tapping out to the Boston Crab but the ref is distracted. Harris hits the catatonic on Loki but again the ref is distracted. Daniels now has the tag belt, but Harris takes it away from him and decides to smack him with it. Loki also nails Harris with the belt with the referee distracted, and that's how this one ends. A bit disappointing, way too much interference to make this a good match. Triple X are now the tag team champions for the second time. Sonny, don't look at my ass, Siaki is in the back beating up D'Lo Brown, but our lord and saviour Slapnuts makes the save for him. Out next, it's Glenn Gilberti of Hollywood. She has a bra on saying badass. She looks like a cheap version of Deborah. Disco says he's here to take sports entertainment extreme to the next level. He says he knows the people want to see tits and ass. Hollywood will apparently be issuing an open challenge to any woman who wants to show her ass and get in the ring. 
Disco asks Athena if she wants to show her ass, but she doesn't seem up for it. He then calls out cage dancer Lollipop, who is used to showing her ass. She agrees to do it and makes her way to the ring. She slowly removes her stripper boots and Hollywood jumps over the spear. They have a cat fight which is blurred out as boobs are exposed for the second episode on this channel in a row. Lollipop doesn't care that her boobs are exposed. She slowly clubs on Hollywood. Then Hollywood just rips her bra off completely and JB rushes to cover Lollipop up. TNA certainly disappoint in delivering their promise of tits, but there wasn't much ass. It's over, what am I even watching it? Slapnuts is out now for the final segment of the show. He'll be doing the running commentary for this number one contenders match. It will be Raven vs AJ Styles. These two have had a great roar of words, but does their wrestling live up to these words? AJ almost hits the Styles clash in the first 30 seconds and Raven has to bail from the ring. Styles drop kicks him for the ropes. AJ tries to dive off the guardrail, but Raven shoves him onto his nutsack. They then come back to the ring for a second where Raven drop toe holds AJ out of the ring again. Raven comes face to face with Slapnuts on commentary. Slappy tells him to worry about Styles. Raven then creams AJ over a chair whilst the ref is distracted. Styles is now busted open. I can't remember seeing him like that in TNA before. Raven's happy to wrestle in the ring now and he hits a clothesline and a running knee lift. Raven follows that by falling on top of Styles on the top rope. AJ's only method of fighting back is to jump onto Raven's back and try and put him to sleep and both men collapse from exhaustion. AJ's now back in this match and he hits the discus clothesline and the spinning heel kick. He also hits the inverted DDT for a two count. Styles then tries to go high risk with a springboard but Raven nails him with a powerbomb. AJ kicks out at two. We get another double down now of AJ hitting a super kick. When they get up AJ is able to hit the head scissors for his own two count. AJ hits the Raven effect now but Raven makes the ropes. We've got a nice match going here but it's about to go wrong. AJ tries to fly onto Raven on the outside but he gets caught with a gut buster. Raven squares up to Jarrett again who decides he's had enough and he beats up Raven and Styles. Then we get a ref bump as Styles misses a drop kick. Raven hits the Raven effect as a referee sprints to the ring, it's just a two. There wasn't even a delay, the ref was so quick. Then we get a second ref bump, AJ hits the Styles clash on Raven as the other referee wakes up but he can only get a two. Raven now has a chair and he hits Styles just as AJ kicks him. Both men sort of cover each other as the two refs wake up and count. They both count a three and nobody knows who won the match as the show goes off the air, so we're probably looking for a triple threat for the title. It's a shame it had to end like that as it was a good clash of stars while it lasted, to pardon the pun. And if you don't agree with that, you better run.